good morning and welcome to uh, this breakfast briefing on tax and superannuation. Um, this is another one of a series put on by Greens List, which is very interesting and helpful to those in practice on both sides of the profession. Um, my name's Robert Davey. I'm a solicitor. I must be one of the rare ones who've been privileged enough to come from the dark side to chair such a meeting. Um, today we have uh, two speakers. Uh, Peter Crofts will be speaking on matters relating to superannuation and Michael Flynn will be dealing with technical tax matters to do with estates with interests in companies and trusts. Um, both speakers, uh, this is a boost for the solicitors, both speakers uh, um, have benefited no doubt considerably from having had uh, a practising life of some years before they signed the role um, and uh, um, uh, that gives them a, a feeling for the sorts of problems that uh, solicitors have as well as problems that council <coughs> have to face. Um, uh, Peter Crofts was admitted to practice in 1982 and signed the, signed the bar role in 2001. Um, before uh, he came to the bar, um, he had a strong commercial background, practiced for many years uh, as a partner and in-house counsel with Deloitte's and before Deloitte's with Dewsbury's. Um, and before that, um, he uh, worked with the National Crime Authority and with a city law firm. Um, in addition to his legal qualifications, he holds accounting qualifications and uh, qualifications in psychology and is an accred accredited mediator. Uh, since signing the bar role and uh, uh, coming to the bar, he has uh, continued to work in the commercial area and uh, uh, a lot of his work is, involves cases where getting to grips with uh, complicated financial information is uh, paramount. Um, he practices in a wide range of areas touching on those subjects. Um, Peter is also a part-time lecturer at uh, Monash and Melbourne Universities and uh, until 2006 was the Deputy Chair of the Marine Parks Compensation Appeals Tribunal. Um, uh, Michael Flynn was admitted to practice in uh, 1985 and signed the bar role in 1993. Um, Michael is a chartered accountant in addition to holding the usual legal qualifications and practices in the area of commercial law, revenue law and trusts. He is the current national president of the Taxation Institute. He's co-authored two books, Death and Taxes, a book about the tax consequences of death, which is Bible for those of us who practice in that area, and Drafting Trusts and Will Trusts in Australia. Um, he is also the editor of the Revenue Law title of the Laws of Australia. Um, now Peter will be speaking first, so if I can welcome Peter to the... Thank you, Rob. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I suspect uh, Rob and Michael uh, realise that I have daughters who are involved in early morning sport and they assumed that I would be the most awake to deal with the first paper um, on the basis that you may not all have been quite as awake. Uh, this is the general wake you up paper uh, so that you're ready for the more detailed concentration on tax issues later on. To do that I want to talk about three broad issues or probably two. Uh, one I want to touch on when is superannuation an estate asset. Secondly I want to look at some of the conflicts that exist between uh, roles as trustee and roles in respect relation to superannuation and particularly death benefits and in that context discuss two cases, the Queensland case of McIntosh of earlier this year and la the decision of uh, Justice Macmillan last year in Worcester and Morris and then possibly offer a, uh, an explanation as to where those cases are going. But I want some participation too because uh, I'm told that the best thing to do is to uh, listen to all the questions I get, incorporate those in my notes and uh, Luke Hales, my clerk, uh, or one of Michael's senior clerks, tells me that uh, he can then send you papers by email and that's a much better way of doing it, Peter, and I thought that was probably very sensible because I'll learn more from you than I present today. I start with the question, when is <coughs> super, or when the super trustee pays death benefits to the legal personal representative? Is that an asset of the estate? 
death benefits, of course, are the member's balance at the date of death and insurance benefits inuring for the deceased's for the deceased, usually life insurance. Now, I said I wanted some participation to wake you all up. Uh, is that an asset of the estate? Those who say yes, hands up. One, two, three. Oh, we're getting, people are waking up. Probably a quarter of the audience, a third. Does that, who says no? Another third. So we've got a third undecided. They'll wake up later. Let's look at or start by looking at the Westpac Master Trust Deed. Clause 6.3a says, on the death of a member, the trustee shall pay a benefit consisting of the insured benefit, if any, and an amount equal to the net balance of the benefit accounts. And where will they pay it? 6.3k, where there is no binding death benefit nomination, it's to be paid to the member or beneficiary's legal personal representative. And then, interestingly, if there is no legal personal representative under A, one or more of the member's dependents in proportions determined by the trustee, or under B, if none, being if no dependents, such other persons as are permitted under the relevant requirements. If you go to the definition section of their deed, dependence is defined by reference to the uh, Superannuation Industry Supervision Act, the CIS Act. Relevant requirements, interestingly, is not defined. So you can imagine a position arising where there are no dependents. Uh, who do I give it to now? And the deed itself doesn't help you. And it's worth looking at deeds. They typically have been done many years ago. They're complex documents and there are always holes in them. I'm going to talk about the Morris case later on, but one of the issues that we faced in Morris was that the definition of death benefit, on one interpretation at least, said death benefit only uh, included the accumulation account plus insurances. Now you'll all be aware that when a, a superannuation fund is in depension phase, the proper accounting treatment is to take the monies necessary to meet the pension and put them in a pension account where they receive different tax treatment. On, according to the uh, <coughs> tax office rulings, on death that reverts to an accumulation account. But there was 930,000 in the super fund, 30,000 was in the accumulation account and 900 in the pension account. So the argument was being run, oh, well even if the binding death benefit's valid, you can only have 30,000 plus the insurance. The 900 isn't caught. Uh, in the end, that argument was not successful, but it goes back to don't ignore trustees. And there is another and even better reason. Let's look at the Australian super trustee. It says, 5.11, when a member dies, the trustee shall hold the benefit payable on the member's death on trust to pay the same in accordance with a valid binding death benefit nomination. That makes sense. In the absence of a valid binding death benefit nomination, to one or more of the following persons, to the exclusion of the other, and in such manner and proportion as the trustees determine, namely, A, to the member's dependents, all the usual people, nothing surprising in that, but B, <coughs> subject to an acceptance of the trust to his or her legal personal representative by way of direct trust operating under this deed for the persons beneficially entitled to the member's residuary estate. Is that an estate asset? Anyone want to change their mind from the vote they gave last time? What about this example? Will leaves the house as a specific bequest to the wife, residuary estate to two adult children in equal shares. That comprises a small share portfolio, car and savings totaling $20,000 death benefit under Australian super of half a mil. Liabilities, funeral and testamentary expenses, 15 grand, and debts to former partners, 100 grand. You're going to pay the 100 grand from the 500, aren't you? No, you're not. Because it's held on trust for the residuary beneficiaries. It's not part of the estate. It's not there to pay, death, pay debts of the estate. So you're going to have to sell the widow's house. 
it's not there for a part four claim. So don't take it for granted that just because the cheque comes to the legal personal representative, it is in fact an asset of the estate. Get the superannuation trust deed, read it. I also want to talk about the conflict between roles as trustee and roles in relation to superannuation, and typically these arise in relation to death benefits, but not exclusively. Most of you will be aware of Macintosh. It's created some interest. Uh, it's a single judge Queensland decision of earlier this year. The facts are important. People seem to have different views of them. The parents were acrimoniously divorced for 34 years. The 41-year-old son died, leaving 80,000 in the estate. It was an intestacy and 453,000 in death benefits through two super funds. Mother was living with the son at death and there was no dispute that she was a dependent. The parents started off arguing over the administration of the intested estate. Both wanted to administer it. In the mother's affidavits in support of her application to administer, she said, as she must, that she would faithfully collect the estate assets. She mentioned the fact that there was superannuation, but didn't provide any further material about it, and specifically didn't say anything about her intention to seek the superannuation death benefit as the, a beneficiary. The mother was a non-binding death benefit nominee of the superannuation. The mother was in the end appointed administrator, but appointed administrator because the father withdrew. He said, it, too hard and costing too much to keep fighting this, I'll stand back. Within three days of being appointed, the mother had applied to the super fund saying, I'm a beneficiary, I want the, the death benefit. In doing so, she said the father and son were estranged, which had been disputed in the administration action. It was her contention, but the father had filed affidavits to the contrary. She claimed not to know the whereabouts of the father other than via his solicitor, which was probably true, but may perhaps be seen to be misleading in the light of um, the fact that they've just run a court case against each other. And of course, she didn't mention that administrative dispute at all. The super fund, perhaps not unsurprisingly, the trustees exercised their discretion in favour of the mother. The father complained. His solicitors wrote to the mother's solicitors saying, hang on, you didn't tell us you were going to do this. There is a conflict. You have a fiduciary duty to go and collect these monies. Uh, you're now preferring yourself. Interestingly, the mother took the matter to the Queensland Supreme Court for directions. It was her argument, and it seems to me correct law, that she, there was no property entitlement of the estate in the superannuation. The superannuation fund was nothing more than a discretionary trust. The trustees had a discretion as to who they would give the monies to, and there was therefore no asset to go and collect. The father said, no, you created a conflict by making your application uh, to get the funds yourself you acted against your fiduciary interest as uh, executor of the estate. You should have made an application as executor of the estate. The court said, yes, you're right. The mother was a fiduciary who gained a benefit. Therefore, all that she got for super is to be paid back into the super fund. Now, this raises a whole lot of questions for you. Does it mean that any executor who has an interest in the super fund has to stand aside? What if the executor is also that the surviving director of a corporate trustee and is therefore going to make the decision as to whom the monies are allocated? What if the executor applies to the super fund and loses? Have you got to appeal it to the superannuation complaints tribunal or in the case of a self-managed fund to the Supreme Court against the exercise of the trustee's discretion? 
can you make an application wearing both hats? Perfectly balanced application. I think at the moment, and I'm interested in reaction around the room from the briefs I've had since McIntosh was handed down, there are a number of practitioners who've leapt on this and said, right, if you are making an application for super in your own right, you must immediately contribute anything you get to the estate. And I think we will see that much more until someone decides this case or raises these issues in Victoria, because it is, after all, a single judge of a Queensland judge. But if you're going to do it, then I suspect you need to go off and get releases from the executors, uh, from the uh, other beneficiaries, and or you need to go and get some directions from the court about what you're doing. The issue of directions from the court came up in Worcester and Morris too. I should indicate that uh, whilst I would like, as uh, one of the council involved, to stand here and take credit for uh, all the positive bits in Worcester and Morris, that would be completely unfair. It was uh, Rob Davies' firm who did all the hard work and, as you all know, good outcomes come from teamwork, not from uh, uh, council's eloquence. The facts of Worcester and Morris were that the father died leaving 920,000 in super. The uh, other member of the fund, who had 300 in the fund at the date of his death, was his co-trustee, his second wife. He'd left a binding death benefit nomination to his daughters by his first marriage. If I can go off on a tangent there, although it's not perhaps relevant to estates, one of the issues that was argued uh, was that the binding death benefit nomination had been prepared by the father, who it was admitted was the person who, if you like, managed the administration of the super fund, and he put it on the administration file. Now, if you look at the CIS regs, 616 says that a trustee on getting a binding death benefit nomination, if they think it's got an invalidity, has got to draw that uh, invalidity to the attention of the donor. And the argument was run, well, that means it has to be handed in during the lifetime of the deceased. And in this case, it wasn't. It was only discovered on the file. So it wasn't even served on the two trustees. So how can it be a binding death benefit nomination? That aspect was actually decided by a special referee uh, in Morris. There, were, there was the issue that I've already raised of the, uh, whether the accumulation account and the pension account should be included. But there was also issues stemming from the fact that the super fund had been set up by a distribution of shares in specie from a family trust and how the family trust treated those, uh, that distribution. Was it a capital distribution? Was it a loan? Was it a distribution uh, taxable from the, the family trust? As a result of all of those issues, it went off to a special referee, which whilst not inexpensive, was I think a very effective way of dealing with quite complex accounting issues. The special referee, who was Stuart Anderson QC, determined that because the uh, trustee of the super fund had had the binding death benefit, benefit nomination in order to determine it invalid, they had in fact received it and he didn't have to decide the other points. That decision was accepted by the court without challenge from anyone but one of the issues that it raises is what would have happened had the wife just torn it up? There wouldn't have been a binding death benefit nomination. So I suspect when you're talking to people about super funds and wills and binding death benefit nominations, it's not enough to just prepare the binding death benefit nomination. If you want to be sure that it's going to have an effect, you need to make sure the trustee gets it either with evidence of service or, better still, a minute of the trustee acknowledging receipt. Side issue. The uh, 
Binding death benefit nomination in Morris was to the daughters by the first marriage. The second wife took advice and first of all, very sensibly appointed a corporate trustee and then declared the binding death benefit nomination invalid for a number of reasons. The daughters, who were also executors, challenged the binding death benefit nomination's alleged invalidity and were successful. And that's not really what I want to talk about here. What was much more relevant, I think, uh, for the topic of this paper is that the second wife then said, all right, I have to pay you the binding death benefit nomination, but as trustee, I have properly on advice defended or my decision in respect of the binding death benefit nomination. I am entitled to indemnity from the fund. The fund that we are dealing with is your father's superannuation interest. So <clears throat> from what was had grown from 920 to a bit over a mil, I'll deduct 300,000 for my costs and the 100,000 I've got to pay you for costs. That's 400,000 from a bit over a mil, you can have 600. And you can imagine the howls from the beneficiaries uh, who said, hang on, what you are now saying is that we've fought you and won and we've got to pay everyone's costs. So that was, I think, the third or fourth decision in Morris. Justice Macmillan said, the trustee fought these claims for the benefit of the second wife. It is not something which they fought for the benefit of the fund. It is therefore not something to which they are entitled to indemnity from the fund. It is something that they are entitled to indemnity from the person who stood to benefit, the second wife. And as the costs exceeded the value of her interest in the fund, she's got to pay the balance personally. Uh, that got a howl from every black letter trust lawyer who said, why should this happen? Neither the uh, McIntosh decision or the Worcester decision considered the question of unconscionability but I think that's the best way of rationalising the decisions and something that perhaps is beholden on solicitors advising executors. There is a stream of decisions coming out of the Supreme Court at the moment on unconscionability. Something to be unconscionable must be something more than just unfair or unjust. It's something more than mere carelessness or negligence. It's conduct that must demonstrate a high level of moral obloquy. Lovely word, isn't it? Clients won't know what it means. That comes from Violet Holmes and Schmidt, Court of Appeal last year. In uh, a later decision, same year, Consumer Affairs and Scully, uh, the Court of Appeal talked about the need for moral taint. And I think that really is what underpins those two decisions there was a moral taint to the mother in Macintosh fighting tooth and nail to be administrator and then going off to the super fund and not telling them all about it. There was a moral taint to Mrs Morris fighting tooth and nail to get something for herself and then saying, oh, but someone else should pay. This, I think, is particularly important. Um, it's not put as uh, an advertisement, rather as a recognition of the interaction between the two levels of the profession. But it is inevitable that solicitors dealing with their clients get caught up in what their clients want to do and need someone who is one step removed is this really unconscionable behaviour or is it nothing more than something that might be unfair but is quite legitimate? Now, many of you have partners of, who usefully provide that sounding board for you. But particularly, as in both Morris and in McIntosh, the court talks about the out for executors and trustees 
of going to the court and seeking directions, I think the obligation on solicitors in the light of those string of decisions is much greater to at least obtain independent advice on whether the action is unconscionable or, if not, actually take it off to the court. And uh, provided that there's monies in the estate, I suppose uh, it uh, might be a, not only a sensible but protective thing to do. Where do I get to in the conflict between the role as trustee and the role in relation to superannuation death benefits? I think you've got to give consideration to it in the acceptance of the executor's role. It's not something that you can ignore any longer. I think as an executor, you need to apply for superannuation death benefits if you can, whether or not you have another uh, entitlement in a different fashion. You need at all times to act in good faith and be seen to be doing so. And that's my point about speaking to other partners in your for firm or council and getting that one step removed decision. I think you need to seriously contemplate applications to the court for directions. Because I think if you don't, what you're going to find is many more applications to remove trustees on the basis of some form of conflict. And again, whilst it's not the topic of this paper, you'll all be aware that uh, Justice Macmillan has clarified the law in that area and made it quite clear that in her view at least, uh, even putative part four claimants have standing to remove a trustee. Thank you for listening to me. I hope you are now fully awake for uh, the more complex paper.